Okay, good. We have our next awesome panel I'm really excited to introduce. We have Jonathan, Mosher, and David, who will be talking to us about defining the variables of a successful NFT project. Really important stuff. Please come on up here and give them a round of applause. Thank you. Mic work, can you hear me? Great, awesome. No, don't worry about it. I love, way, I love the way they just give us the mic and like we've got to lead it ourselves, right? So I think what we're going to do, obviously we're going to talk about the variables of a project success, but I think before we get into that, we're going to just do our brief intros. My name is Mosharov. I'm founder of the NFT Alpha podcast. This is actually my co-host as well. We're going to talk, uh, he's going to intro himself. And uh, primarily uh, within Web3, I got into it in uh, late 2020 with CryptoPunks, um, bought in heavy with CryptoPunks, bought in heavy with Basie, bought in heavy with VFriends. And so it's just been an interesting journey of, um, I guess it's more of a dynamic journey because if you were around last year, the, the landscape of Web3 has very much changed from last year to this year. And so obviously we're gonna talk about that. So that's where I'm at. David, do you wanna intro? Hey everyone. Oh, is this working? I think it is, but... Yeah, perfect. I'm David. I just want to say that this picture was taken, I think... Um, <laughs> fuck, so I'm 30 now, and I think I was 23 in that picture, so 13. I don't look like that anymore. I haven't worn a suit in about six years, and I'm definitely... Well, I'm probably still as stuck up. Um, so <laughs> my background is in law. I uh, started as a lawyer, one of those city lawyers that wore suits to work every day. Um, that, that guy, yeah. Um, and... Late last year, uh, I started a company called Webmint with a couple of co-founders who I met on Discord. And we basically launched 10 projects uh, through our tool. Eight of them sold out. One of them became number one on OpenSea. Um, so today I'll just be talking about what made those projects successful. But like any good lawyer, I just want to start with a disclaimer, which is anything I say is only applicable to what we've done with our eight projects. Whether that has any universal applicability is uh, TBD. Uh, I'm Jonathan. Um, got involved in crypto probably back in 2018, um, and in F NFTs from probably beginning of last year. Um, been helping Simon on the podcast for the last six months or so, um, and I suppose I might as well address my picture up there as well. That was a. Uh, it's a great picture. Going through hell. Um, after hitting the wall in the Berlin Marathon, and uh, just nobody cares, work harder. <laughs> so I think the, the best way I think we're going to formulate this topic is to look at it from an investor standpoint, which is when you're looking to buy into a project, and then looking at it from a project developer's standpoint, which I think we'll push to you, David, on that, if you want to, we'll talk about that uh, second. So I'll give my input, and then we'll push to Jonathan, and we'll push to you, David, you can either give like your personal or professional input as a project mm -hmm. developer, or whatever. So last year, depending on when you guys actually entered into Web3, it was like finding projects was a sort of a different skill in itself. It was very elementary or, dare I say, it, primitive. So what we would do is we would go on this thing called Rarity Tools. We'd go down the list. We would look at things like the Twitter following. We would look at the Discord following, right? Yeah. And, uh, and then we're like, yeah, this is it. And uh, that was all bullshit. So uh, we found out then that you could fake the Discord followers. You could fake the Twitter to followers as well. And the roadmap couldn't necessarily be held accountable. So like people would be like, you know, we're going to go to the moon, literally. And uh, they would never deliver on that. And so I guess we now push into something different. The standards that we had last year are completely different to the ones that we have now. And the standards next year will be completely different to the ones we have now also. What it is now is, I don't think we really know what the variables are to a project success. I don't think anybody knows. So here's what we do know, speculatively. VC backing, right? You would say, well, you know, we see a lot of projects, whether it's Doodles or Moonbirds, or whether it's VFriends, rip, rip, are reaching for venture backing and have achieved it. And so with that comes a deliverable, or with not just a deliverable, also a time horizon for that deliverable. And so we would say, okay, so that could be a good indicator of success. But then again, what, what do VC firms know about Web3? Not very much is the answer. They know about as much as we do, because we're all starting at the same place, which is important for everyone to bear in mind, regardless of where you're at with your journey, yeah? 
And then we have team doxing, right? Which is like, you know, last year we were like, yeah, let's don't worry about it. You know, they got some great PFPs. But I think the, the, the variable is if somebody is asking you for money, then they need to be doxed. Yeah, if there's an exchange of, of tender, whatever, then they need to be doxed. And what that really means is when, when I see a, do, uh, a doxed team, what, what we're really looking for, in fact, that's the first thing I look for in a, in, a, in a project, really. We have a bunch of projects on and almost, I mean, practically all of them are doxed, otherwise they probably wouldn't be on, is they are demonstrating their willingness to take accountability for the project, yeah? And then um, I guess the final, there's, there's two other variables. One is Web2 performance. So we have also, we've, we've had, uh, been privileged enough to have a lot of Web2 um, uh, performers that are now bridging into Web3. And so when you look at that project, it's important to bear in mind what they've performed in Web2. You know, we had Gowala who uh, um, were brought out by, um, I don't know who they were brought out by, but they were certainly invested with Kevin Rose and Gary Vaynerchuk, some significant figures and significant um, performers in Web2. And so that's, that's also another variable that you may want to consider. And the final one, I can't remember. What is the final one? I've got it on my phone. Oh, that was it. So when we talk about the roadmap, it was like, well, you know, you can say, because like the roadmap is naturally an indicator to buy or, or a motivation to buy. So it's like, what is the project set to deliver? And will it actually deliver? So if you have something that mints out, is, does that mean you're going to deliver on that mo roadmap? And that was a big concern for everyone. But now, um, what it is, is that given we've got now uh, EU guidance, as well as um, we've got SEC guidance on how to tax an NFT, um, Whenever you are releasing a project within the EU, you must submit your white paper of your deliverables or what you're proposing to deliver to the local regulators within your country. And that's so that you can be held accountable. So I'll, I'll just push to John for what he thinks is, and then you can go around. Yeah, um, I know with the VC stuff, you know, you only tend to see the VC backing for the bigger companies, bigger projects. Um, usually they've got a Web2 background and they're, they've got a proven track record. Um, so that's obviously a big indicator of what will be a successful project or that w something that will be around for a long time to come. Um, there's another thing, we, we had a kind of brief call a couple of weeks ago and David touched on community and I think for me that's, that's a massive one. Um, like I think it's a, it's a great show on a project of what they've built if their community is not only loyal but they stick around and you know, like for me, that's that's one of the biggest things. What do you think, David? Um, yeah. So our, the second project that we launched, it's called Tasty Bones. It reached number one on OpenSea. It didn't get any VC backing, but it's got eleven thousand ETH in trade volume, um, and it generated about twenty-three million dollars. Um, so I personally haven't invested that much into NFTs. We've just launched a bunch of them, and for us, I think what we realized when we launched Tasty Bones was that. The NFT game is not about technology, but it's about IP. So the first project we launched, we did a bunch of cool things with tech. We had dynamic traits. We allowed people to you know, swap uh, their traits with each other in a gasless way without compromising any of the metadata. Uh, we had like giveaway portals. We had our own token. Uh, but people just didn't really care about that. So for our second project, what we really focused on was just the IP rather than the tech. So we stripped back all these features, and we were just very consistent in our theme um, and our messaging um, and, you know, our roadmap and our design, it was not very thought out, but it was always based on this idea of fun, playful uh, cartoons and all the collaborations that we did enter into in terms of, you know, real-life partnerships and pro partnering with other projects all fit into our theme of, you know, these hungry ghosts that were there to uh, collect food for their friends. Um, so I think it's all about understanding that NFTs is about recognition and IP rather than building anything uh, with amazing technology. Uh, the number of projects that we see that say, you know, we're going to go to the metaverse or um, just the other day uh, there was a project that launched um, that made that had no co coherent messaging. So they had something like, oh, we're going to give everyone Adobe memberships, uh, but, the, but it was all about anime. Um, so it just needs to have consistency, I think. The other thing I just want to mention um, is, I think a lot of people don't touch on this, but it's just luck. What defines success, I think not just in NFTs, but in any project, is so true. blind luck. Being at the right place at the right time and being noticed by the right people. There are things you can do to maximize your luck, but a lot of it is just randomness. I do wonder if like the Board 8 Yacht Club were to release today, whether they'd do as well. 
I don't think they would. No, definitely not. Would. I, I think when they had that situation with MoonPay and uh, that onboarding process, and I can't remember, I, I think there was significance around the IP rights. That was quite innovative at the time. And I think, you know, you touched on IP, and uh, we've been on this adventure of, of understanding what IP is as well as royalties, which is like a boring subject now, to be honest with you. But when, I think, I think it comes down to when you look at these projects and they propose that you have IP rights across your token, right? Uh, the main question that I ask is, is the IP revocable? So with Moonbirds, you had IP rights, which I don't know if you guys are familiar. Moonbirds, Kevin Rose, he's like one of the top five executors within Web3 himself. Uh, next to him is like Gary Vee and like uh, Mark Zuckerberg and stuff like that. And so their phase two project was Moonbirds. They deployed um, IP rights across those Moonbirds so that you could commercialize with them, which basically means you can make money from them. And, uh, you know, people ensued in actually creating these deals for themselves so they could monopolize on their tokens. That was then pulled away from them and a, a Creative Commons contract was deployed or a licensing contract was deployed so that anyone could use the Moonbirds. You could put them on toilet paper. You can put them on marijuana packets. You could do whatever you want with them. So the question, I think, again, when we pitch back to this topic is, if you're being um, proposed IP rights for a project, the question that you should ask is, is the IP rights revocable? And don't accept shit like, oh, we've got no intention of doing that. People change their minds, don't they? We all know that, we're human, and so do companies. You know, this is a very, like, I mean, like, I, like last year, we'd have to, like, we would, it was like, it was like handling a slippery fish, this market. The, the Web3 landscape, we'd learn it in six weeks, and then it would all change again. And then we'd have to learn it all over again. And so I think that's an important um, thing to bear in mind. I don't know if you guys want to resonate or, or chime in with that. Yeah, like, uh, I think last summer, it w everybody was thinking, this is going to be the next BAYC. And yeah. everybody has a wallet full of stuff that isn't the next BAYC. Um, and I think that's a learning lesson, like in the space as well. And you know, it's very, very easy to, you know, overcommit. And I know everybody always says, only put in what you can afford to lose. And not everybody does that. Um, and I think that's that's a hard lesson that a lot of people have learned the hard way in the past year. Um, yeah, is that on the table? Yeah, I mean, just from a legal perspective, I think when you purchase an NFT, a lot of people assume that they own the art. But legally speaking, there is a distinction between the underlying art and the token. I mean, the token just represents a piece of metadata that's on the blockchain. The art is just something that's associated, um, and generally it's licensed to the holder. Um, I think that NFTs have done a great job in sort of decentralizing or changing the way that IP is traditionally distributed. I mean, if you look at Disney, for example, everything is very centralized. Um, and they control how Mickey Mouse or Donald Duck is, is, is Disney, yeah? Yeah, Donald, so. Donald Duck is sort of <laughs> centrally uh, distributed. But whereas if you look at Board Ape, when you purchase the token, um, you don't own the art, but you do have a, I don't know if it's a revocable or not, but you do have a perpetual license to use the art in any manner that you deem is, you deem necessary. And that way it's, it's able to sort of spread its IP through its holders. Um, in a much faster manner than you know traditional Web 2. I think that if you understand that NFTs are about IP, allowing your holders to actually do the marketing for you is really going to lead to uh, much quicker brand recognition. I definitely agree with that. I don't think when it comes to deploying IP across token holders, I don't think it's a good idea, man. I don't think we're all professionals in building IP. Mm. So like, um, yeah, I, don't, I just don't feel like that's going to lead to anything. We, we've definitely spoken about it a ton <laughs> yeah. before of, you know, it's a great idea until it's not. Until <laughs> yeah. there's one bad apple. Yeah. All of a sudden, that, that whatever happens, that's tied to that whole project. Definitely. And yeah. Mud sticks. So I, I think um, unless you want to, do you guys want to add more into this? Because I think we should push into actually onboarding about what the onboarding process is when we look at Reddit and or Apple or Starbucks or something like that. Do you want to talk about that, or do you want to push to something else? Happy to do that. Yeah. So. This has been a hot topic. We actually don't, uh, we, I mean, this is something that's up and coming, which is, well, it's not really up and coming, it's established, to be honest with you, which is onboarding, you know, these mainstream brands, which, to be honest with you, we all thought they weren't going to come in, but we did predict that hopefully that they would. And the reason why we didn't think they were going to come in is because they didn't have regulations, things called security or investment vehicles, so that you could um, derive from that investment protection. Uh, mainstream brands don't give a shit about that. Um, Apparently, because if you look at things like Starbucks or Reddit or Mercedes-Benz or Adidas, anyone significant, if you put in something like that into Google, it will come up with something. 
And so that's been a very interesting process about essentially how do we broaden the population within Web3? And part of that is, is taking a stakeholder from a brand that uh, someone is enthusiastic for and then bringing them into Web3 through that onboarding process. So there's like Rainmakers as well. I, I think more recently, I don't know if you guys are familiar, but we saw with the Reddit, that was a huge onboarding process. It was like the largest token collection um, uh, within Web3. So Reddit, Reddit essentially deployed um, their NFT overnight, and three million wallets were then created, and consequently three million, uh, I think it's like 2,900,000 uh, NFTs were minted. And what that, and like they did it under the Trojan horse thing, which again, what we've been talking about is that essentially they um, called it, what do they call them, digital avatars? Digital collectibles. Digital collectibles, I always get that wrong. And so the people on Reddit were like, these guys are with uh, NFTs, man, they're losers. And it's like, yeah, man, you're holding a polygon-based NFT. So that was an interesting one. Um, and uh, we see, uh, and uh, I think, you know, we, we're not going to have, well, we have, do have tax guidance on NFTs uh, across the pond. We don't actually have any regulation about how these NFTs sit within the category of whether they're investment uh, vehicles or not. And, uh, but I, I do believe uh, that uh, mainstream brands will continue to um, onboard their, their client bases. So I'll push to any of you guys. Yeah, so we're, we're actually currently working with a very large clothing uh, brand that are based in Singapore. Um, and the reason we asked them, you know, why do you want to work with us? There's, there's so many other sort of development companies. There's so many other projects out there that you can work with. And the thing that this came back to was really just reach. Uh, you know, marketing is everything, whether it's Web 2 or Web 3. Um, and across all of our projects, we managed to... Uh, get a reach of around a million people on social media. I know social following isn't everything, but it is a, a face value metric that a lot of brands look at in terms of engagement. Um, so what made us successful was that we were able to do a lot of collaborations with other great projects. And so now this clothing company is coming onto us because they want to onboard their users onto Web3. And the way they see um, that happening is by doing collaborations between uh, NFT projects in this case, our NFT projects with their existing sort of members. So we'll be doing some sort of uh, clothing collaboration, but also things like discounts and, and then also uh, cross-marketing. So I think it's important um, in terms of onboarding a, a new wave of users to be able to collaborate and work with existing uh, projects um, that are already very successful in the space whether you want to launch a new project or whether you have an existing Web2 audience that you want to take into Web3. Yeah, that, that's something that we've also spoken about quite a good bit with the onboarding process that we see the biggest on-ramp is going to be when people don't know that they're actually being onboarded into Web3. And the likes of Starbucks um, is going to be one of the big ones for doing that where it will be just part of the rewards program. You will own your NFT, whether you know you own it or whether it's just a sticker in your app, you know, that that's what we see is gonna be one of the biggest on-ramps anyway and onboarding for people. Yeah, we definitely thought that, I mean, we were prophesizing it was gonna be gaming, right? Which I'm not a big gamer, and actually to sell a gaming NFT is a lot more, um, is a lot harder than selling a PFP because, like, PFP projects have their limitations at the moment. They're, they're lacking innovation. Like, I have no interest in having a piece of merchandise which is, you know, equates to a T-shirt or some socks um, as a utility activation for my NFT. And so I think we need a bit of work to do there when it comes to innovation. So what happens is, is naturally when you're in Web3, and I'm sure, again, many of you are here for a reason, you look for different horizons. And one of those horizons we've been looking at is gaming, right? Which is like, <coughs> if PFP project was like a three by three Rubik's Cube or however big a Rubik's Cube is, Plato and gaming is like a 24 by 24. It's a lot more comprehensive and the rewards are not actually any more significant. Like, there's these different processes about, um, like I'm not a gaming specialist, I can't necessarily um, comment on it. We have one of our co-hosts is about the retention rate, right? So, like, and you can push from that about, you know, like, you get bored of a game. Do you ever get bored of artwork? Probably not. So then, therefore, you would push to artwork. Do you get bored of music? Yes, you do, unless you've got, like, a Mariah Carey hit that, that hits around Christmas. And then you say, well, okay, we can apply that framework not just to gaming, we can apply that to music. So we have music NFTs, right, which is removing the middleman, you know, removing the, the record labels, which goes straight to the, um, you, know, you, you know, fans have more creative, I say creative control, but they have more impact on, on, the, on the creator, um, as it were, when it comes to, you know, wherever they're gonna end up. And so that's been an interesting one. But what my point is, is that 
Um, when you look at the statistics or the data, like there was a recent survey that was pulled on what gamers' attitudes were to like Web3, they fucking hated it. They thought it was expensive, they thought it was a scam, and they, they thought there was too many barriers to get into Web3. And you know how it is, right? The barriers to get into Web3, you've got to set yourself up on MetaMask wallet, you've got to do a Coinbase, it's all bullshit. It's hard to get there. And I think that is actually, when it comes to onboarding, that is a hurdle uh, that we need to get over. Um, we see these projects that are actually um, they're enabling you to buy these tokens straight from fiat, so straight from like credit card and stuff like that, and so that's an important consideration. I know we're, we're time sensitive, so I'm gonna push to, to you guys and then we can maybe cover another topic if any of you got a commentary on anything else. Yeah, just, just one quick thing, like uh, Swalz, my other co-host on, on our show, he's a gaming expert and an NFT um, gaming consultant, and we've definitely spoke like numerous times about I'm sure he's blue in the face trying to get us to trying to trying to <laughs> yeah. do play to earn gaming because he introduced us to so much and it like the way we kind of look at it is well hang on we're looking at a monetary uh, kind of point of view kind of going well if it's going to take us three hours to earn ten dollars worth of whatever NFT whereas if we were actually working for three hours what could we earn so um, that's kind of the, the kind of little bit of a battle that Swalsom does have with us kind of constantly pretty much but. You got anything on that, David? Nothing on gaming, um, but just this idea of utility. Um, and I think we, we were working with this music label producer who also hosts concerts, um, and they wanted to enter into Web3. Um, and so we sat down, um, and we're going to do a trial based on a Christmas event that they've got coming up. And the biggest question for us was, why would any of your users purchase a ticket on the blockchain when they can just do it via Ticketmaster? Um, so I think we see a lot of brands trying to enter into Web3 just because it sounds sexy, uh, but it's all about having an additional incentive to actually enter. So for us, we, we integrated with a company called Winter that were able to take payments by Fiat, uh, and we, we released the NFT versions of the tickets more as a exclusive membership uh, that would offer additional you know, early bird access to future events, um, discounts, as well as this idea that instead of having your membership controlled by Ticketmaster or by the organization, you control that membership and when you don't support the, the record label anymore, you can then sell it to one of your friends because they are going to be limited in number. Okay, we have like two minutes and 45 seconds. Who's got questions? I'm dead serious. Otherwise, we're going to talk about royalties and that's just boring, right? So has anyone got any questions? Excellent, we can talk about royalties. Right, okay, so royalties are not enforceable on the blockchain. Did you know that? Well, not enforceable on the smart contract. Well, you missed IMX's uh, talk this morning, so they're going to make them enforceable on their contracts. Are they? Yeah, he announced it this Sorry, morning. Sorry, I wasn't there. I was <laughs> in traffic. So that's an interesting one. It's not really, to be honest with you, because I think well, we've done it to death. But I, I think we see a lot of, um, I, you know, I was sold on this dream, like, you know, where... You could be an artist, you could do a piece of artwork, sell it as an NFT for like 50 pence or whatever it costs. And as you establish who you are, um, you have um, provenance on that. And so consequently, you can go back and buy um, Pablo Picasso's first piece of artwork. And that person, providing they're alive or their estate is still established, they can still get paid on that. They can still get paid royalties. And I thought that was fantastic. That was part of the reason that drew, drew me in is that significance of originality. Because I... You know, unfortunately, if you're creative, it's very hard to monetize, we've come to realize. It's very hard, you know, you've got to, you've got to get into, uh, into bed with someone that knows what marketing is like and how to market yourself. And so um, I really like that idea of bringing, because like cryptocurrency is boring. Talking about, it's just so boring to talk about. And so when NFTs came about, it brought the creative community in with the financial community and they came together and they were, it's almost like working together, right? And obviously there's malice um, characters operating in it, which I'm sure you guys are all aware of, rug pulls and stuff like that. But um, we have this shift at the moment where it's either like projects are starting up their own marketplaces or platforms are deploying 0% royalties. I don't know really where that's going to go. We have like, we had recent news where there's like a membership fee, but basically people go where the cheapest place is. I came here for the money. That's it. That's what I came in there for. I stayed for the people, though. That's the thing. So, and I think everyone, at least the majority of people, did come in here to make money. And it's significant life-changing money. And I think it's important to acknowledge that um, when it comes to looking at who we're paying, whether it's the, the royalty sector, because like everyone's just going to go to the marketplace that has 0% royalties and is the cheapest price. And a race to the bottom is never, never good for anybody. What way do you use, do your royalties when you, you're launching the projects? Have you got a set way of doing it, or is every project different? 
Uh, no, every project is different, but I personally like no royalties. I mean, the majority of our projects made, you know, like 80% of its revenue from royalties. Um, but I think that removing royalties is great because it's going to encourage projects to actually think about how they can generate revenue other than just, you know, bumping up the floor price and selling on a secondary market. So what we're seeing right now with a lot of our users is that they are focusing more on utility and then also making their initial NFT more expensive. So just finally, guys, we're running out of time. So if you want to uh, look for me on Twitter, for Moshe Roth, you want to look for Jonathan. And David, how do people get hold of you? At Webmint with a three instead of an E. That's good. Webminty. Webmint, but instead of the E, it's a three. Excellent. Guys, thanks so much for your attention today. Very we much. wish you the best. Thank you, guys.